In this video, we're going to look at how to journalize transactions from the point of view of the seller when the seller is engaging in merchandising transactions. In the last video, we bought inventory for $10 each. You don't leave inventory sitting around, you want to sell it. So in this example, we're going to sell the inventory that we purchased for $10 each. So in our first transaction, the seller is going to sell 1,000 units of inventory for $25 each sales price. The inventory costs the seller $10 each. The sale has terms 210 net 30 with shipping of $250. So let's look at the journal entries in case one if the FOB is the shipping point. So if you remember with FOB shipping point, the seller's responsibility ends at the shipping point. So the buyer is going to have to pay shipping. So what the seller would do would calculate sales revenue of 1,000 units sold multiplied by the $25 sales price. The seller would have sales revenue of $25,000. The seller would also calculate the cost of the sale as 1,000 units multiplied by the $10 cost to purchase each. In the next chapter, we'll look a little bit more closely at the cost of goods sold. So in this case, the buyer would have a $10,000 cost of goods sold, and the amount due from the customer would be the sales revenue of $25,000 plus the shipping of $250 because the buyer pays the shipping to the seller and the seller will then pay the shipping outlet, whether it's UPS or um, FedEx or whatever it is. So the amount due from the seller is going to be $25,250. So to journalize this, the seller would debit accounts receivable for $25,250, but only credit sales revenue for $25,000. If they paid the shipping immediately, they'd credit cash for $250. If not, at the time of the sale, they'd credit shipping payable for $250. And when they paid the shipping, reduce the shipping payable, debit shipping payable, and credit cash. Then the seller is also going to recognize a $10,000 cost of goods sold, debit cost of goods sold $10,000, and credit inventory for $10,000. Let's look a little more closely at this journal entry. Accounts receivable is an asset, so that goes on the balance sheet. Sales revenue is a revenue account, so that is going to go to the income statement. Cash is an asset. Shipping payable is a liability. Both would kick over to the balance sheet. Cost of goods sold is an expense. It's generally one of the very, very few expenses you're going to have that doesn't have the word expense in the title, that is going to go to the income statement. And finally, inventory is an asset, so that is going to kick on over to the balance sheet. So if this were your only transaction, if you were going to prepare the income statement, you would show sales revenue of $25,000 cost of goods sold of 10,000. Notice they're on opposite sides. They would subtract from each other to calculate a gross profit of $15,000, exactly what you would want. Now let's look at case two. The sale could have been FOB destination. If the sale was FOB destination, remember the seller's responsibility ends at the FOB point, so the seller has to get it to the destination, seller pays shipping. So in this case, the seller would still calculate revenue as the 1,000 units sold multiplied by the $25 sales price and would still calculate the cost of the sale as the 1,000 units sold multiplied by the $10 cost per unit. In this case, the seller would debit accounts receivable for $25,000 and credit sales revenue for $25,000, debit cost of goods sold $10,000 and credit inventory for $10,000. The same thing would apply. Sales revenue and cost of goods sold would be the only two accounts kicked over to the income statement. They're on opposite sides. They subtract from each other.
Now, when the seller pays shipping, that is a separate period expense. It is not increased to cost of goods sold. It's not a reduction to sales revenue. It is expensed when incurred. So when the seller pays the shipping expense, they would debit delivery expense or shipping expense and credit cash. Now, let's say the buyer returns 100 units before paying. So in this case, both the seller and the buyer would calculate the amount of the return as 100 units returned multiplied by the sale price of $25. So that would be a $2,500 return. The seller alone would calculate the cost of the return, 100 units returned that cost the seller $10 each. $1,000 of inventory is going to be returned to inventory. So basically what you want to do with the return is you want to reverse the original journal entry. The original journal entry increased the receivable and increased the revenue. You want to do exactly the opposite. You want to decrease the receivable and decrease the revenue. Same thing here. The sale increased the cost of goods sold and decreased inventory. In this case, you want to return it to inventory and decrease the cost of goods sold. So we would debit an account called sales returns and allowances. We do that instead of debiting sales revenue. So we have the amount of our returns and allowances. And you'll see at the end of the period, we close sales returns and allowances into sales revenue. So eventually it will be deducted from sales revenue, just not right now. And then we credit accounts receivable for $2,500 to reduce it. Then we would debit inventory for $1,000 to return it to inventory and credit cost of goods sold because those units were not sold. Now, if the buyer is granted a sales allowance, the difference between a return and an allowance is with a return, the buyer physically returns the unit. So the buyer gets back money because the units are unacceptable, but the buyer physically returns the units to the seller. With an allowance, what happens is the seller grants the buyer money because the units are unacceptable, but the buyer does not return the units to the seller. So in this case, the seller would just show a reduction to the sales revenue and not an increase in the inventory and a reduction of the cost of goods sold. So if the buyer is granted a sales allowance of $2,500, the seller would reduce the sales revenue by debiting sales returns and allowances by $2,500 and would reduce or credit the accounts receivable by $2,500. There would be no corresponding return to inventory. Now let's look at two separate cases. In the first case, the buyer does not pay within the discount period. And let's use the more difficult example with the FOB shipping point. So the buyer has prepaid the shipping to the seller. So if the buyer does not pay within the discount period, the buyer had purchased 1,000 units at $25, returned 100 units at $25, and then on top of that, you're going to add $250 in shipping. So in this case, the buyer would owe the seller $22,750. So when the buyer pays the seller, the seller receives $22,750 in cash and would credit the accounts receivable $22,750. And let's take a quick look at the accounts receivable. When we used FOB shipping point, the accounts receivable started off with a debit of $25,250. And then you can see over here, when we returned the inventory, we credited the account 2,500. So 25,250 minus 2,500 gives us the 22,750 
that the buyer is going to pay to the seller. So the right amount of money is received and this is going to zero out the accounts receivable. Now, if the buyer pays within the discount period, the difficult thing about this calculation is that the buyer gets a 2% discount, but the shipping that they prepaid is not subject to the discount. So what you'd have to do is first calculate the amount that is subject to the discount. So we take the 1,000 units that were purchased at $25, subtract the return of 100 units excuse me, at $25. So that is the amount that is subject to the discount. So what we want to do is we want to multiply that by 100% minus 2%. So if we have a 2% discount, we subtract the 2% discount to calculate the remainder. Now, once we have done all of that, once we have taken the amount of the sale that is subject to the discount and multiplied that by 1 minus the discount percentage, then on top of that, we are going to add the $250 in shipping. So in this case, the buyer would pay to the seller $22,300, which is the $22,750 plus the $250 in shipping minus the discount. So the discount we could calculate as 2% of the amount subject. So to calculate the amount of the discount, we can take the 1,000 units sold multiply that by $25, subtract the 100 units returned, multiply that by $25, and then multiply that by 2%. So we can see the discount amount is $450. So if we take the $22,750 before the discount, subtract the discount to $450, we get the amount the buyer would pay within the discount period, $22,300. So in this case, what the buyer is going to do is the buyer is going to debit cash for $22,300. We just calculated the amount of the discount as $450. So we debit sales discounts for $450. And we're going to credit accounts receivable for the full amount of the accounts receivable, $22,750, which zeroes out the accounts receivable and we have now journalized all of the sales transactions by the seller.